The hearings have raised the prospect that former President Trump faces real legal liability for his actions before and on January 6th, among them obstructing a congressional proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, seditious conspiracy, wire fraud, and, as we just were talking about, possible witness tampering. So joining me now to sort of go through this is our NBC News legal analyst, Danny Savalos. So, Danny, you, you see those five charges there. You've watched these hearings with me. Where are the, which are the charges that the former president ought to really be concerned about? You had the one that I think is the most pertinent, dead last on that list, and it is witness tampering. Okay. And the reason I say so is that Congress specifically enacted the relevant statute, Section 1512, in order to make it more expansive, to sweep more broadly and cover any official proceeding. It doesn't need to be a grand jury proceeding or a judicial proceeding. Mm -hmm. And the witness doesn't even have to actually testify. The witness doesn't even need to have first-hand knowledge. This statute just prevents or criminalizes any kind of harassment or corrupt persuasion mm -hmm. in order to prevent a witness from communicating information to law enforcement. And I got to tell you, I mean, I've defended cases where the corrupt persuasion standard uh, is in play. And when you look up what it means to do something corruptly, the definition is an improper purpose. So you're right back at square one. And the point I make there is that it's very malleable. And the government knows that, and that's why they succeed very often whenever they you bring charges. You think it's charges. an easier case to bring in some ways, witness I tampering? Do. Absolutely. Anytime you have that corrupt persuasion standard, and it appears in other uh, statutes in the U.S. Code, it makes it relatively easy to prove an improper purpose. I mean, what's an improper purpose? Uh, it might be preventing this information from going to law enforcement, not necessarily testifying under oath. That was Congress's intent when it passed Section 1512, to make this sweep as broadly as possible and protect witnesses. What about his actions on January 6th? It, it is more and more looks like he was an active participant rather than, as we stated earlier, a passive observer. Is there a there there? Potentially, at least according to Judge David Carter, who mm -hmm. uh, had an opinion several months ago. Now, I caution folks that in laying out a kind of map for prosecuting Trump and John Eastman for, say, conspiracy to, I guess, defraud the United States or to obstruct a proceeding, if you're looking for that, this opinion does give kind of a roadmap, but it was in the context of deciding that there was no privilege. So folks should understand it has no direct effect. It's not the effect of a probable cause finding. Okay. It's almost like an advisory opinion. It's almost like the judge saying, hey, here's my take on it, but it really only goes to whether or not privilege applies. But folks at the time pointed out correctly that this provided a basic roadmap for DOJ officials, very much like these congressional hearings are providing a roadmap for the DOJ. But at the same time, I put an asterisk on that because whatever power the committee has to obtain information, the DOJ has superpowers compared so to the committee. That's exactly what the Congresswoman was just saying. And in fact, when she was sort of responding to this idea that justice was shocked by Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony, and she just said, you got basically more powerful subpoenas than Congress does. What are you guys doing? What does it tell you that a witness surprised them? Does it tell you that their investigation is not as thorough yet? It tells me, if that's true, that Hutchinson must have flown under their radar, and by they I mean the DOJ, because the DOJ has vast abilities to investigate, much more than a congressional committee. By the way, Chuck, in the last few years, we've all seen what happens if a witness really doesn't want to comply with a congressional subpoena. Ah, forget it, I'm not showing up. Mm -hmm. And it's up to Congress to try and go through its well, let's say, uh, questionable abilities to enforce those subpoenas. Meanwhile, the DOJ, when it wants a subpoena enforced, it enforces the subpoena. They also can go to a judge and get a search warrant, which is even more powerful, where they do the searching themselves. And in a grand jury proceeding, everything's secret. We don't even know right. what they're looking at unless and until they indict. All right, so let's take their surprise at their word that she flew under the radar. What part of this are they... It, it does seem as if they've got a lot of effort on, on the people who went after the Capitol. They got a lot of effort on some of the far-right violent groups. They're doing something on the elector front. We saw all that action. It does not look like they've penetrated the West Wing. That's essentially what they're admitting here, if they're shocked by Cassidy, that they have not yet touched the president. You think that's a Garland decision? It is a Garland decision. I mean, it could be said that all of these committee hearings are for the American public, but they're also for an audience of one, mm -hmm. and that's Merrick Garland. But the DOJ is going to be circumspect about what they have and what they don't have. Do I think they were truly shocked by what Cassidy Hutchinson said? Only if 
she stated something under oath the other day that was, for the first time, never before disclosed. That's really, in my mind, the only way the DOJ could have been surprised, because, Chuck, this is an institution, the DOJ, that was built to investigate. It was built to persuade witnesses to come in and talk to them mm -hmm. or to testify. I mean, when you see a witness testify under oath, that's kind of the end of the long path. Uh, the DOJ has so many tools to get somebody to come in and bear their soul, yeah. uh, not the least of which reminding them that they may be in huge trouble for even lying to a federal agent. Realistically, we know how long DOJ has been working on this. When do you think they would feel that they have enough to start pursuing indictments? Are we six months away, a year away? What's your estimate? That's always the big question. When and do they have enough? And again, the DOJ was designed to investigate and for what, since their inception, yeah. they do not let you know. They don't give a status report on where they are with investigations. They remain silent. And sometimes you or anyone else well, may be investigated. People like lawyers, people like you to tell us, hey, this happened, this happened. That's exactly. Yeah, out. I mean, yeah. And, and people who may be targets may never have known they were targets if the DOJ declines to indict. I mean, that's how secretive they are and how, how many more tools they have to not only persuade people to come in and talk to them, right. but obtain documents, search warrants, things like that. So this whole part about the Cassidy Hutchinson shocking the DOJ, yeah. that might be a little bit of spin on their part. It has to be because if she was anywhere on the radar, the DOJ would have been all over it, and they would have been over it silently. And if, there's, if she's not on their radar, it makes you wonder how thorough they're being. Danny Savalos, I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.